this week, I was listening to a gentleman who professed to have started attending the Roman Catholic Church, having left the Protestant Church. Now, I don't agree, I don't know why he did that, but his lecture was about Islam and the fact that most Americans weren't taking note of how Islamic people just think entirely differently than we do. They just, they don't see the world. You know, we will think of doing kindness to others, and others of other religions and backgrounds will turn that and use that. They know how we think, because it's different than the way they think. But often we just assume that people will want to uh, treat us as we treat them. That's not true. I mean, whether you're talking the Chinese with the Uyghurs in northern part of China, whether you're talking about Islam and the worldwide slavery and the sex trade that's going on today, whether you're talking about tribal groups in the Africa Coast, I've never seen more racist people than the Africans I'm among. A little bit of shade of color, different tribe, huge difference. There is a system and understanding that I came to understand a number of years ago that's really helpful to understand the Corinthians problem. So I've got a big commentary out. It was outside. It's like a master's or doctoral thesis from somebody. It's about, you know, an inch and a half thick, eight and a half by And you're welcome to read it. He does a great job of proving this out. But have you ever heard of a, something called clientelism or patronage? Okay. Gary, you've heard of, you've heard of it. Do you, do you know kind of how it functions? It's a whole different way of seeing the world and relating to it, okay? But do you remember when um, I referred to something a few weeks back when I shared, I said that some people in the world believe that God has ordained other people to take care of them? The patronage system, or clientelism, are the terms that we use to describe that structure if you're going to anthropology or other areas. And the way those people think is, literally, that God has established, in India they'd call it a caste system, but a hierarchy among people. In our culture, the divine right of kings was a simplified build out of the same version. God spoke to that one man, and he told us what God, what God expected of us, and we were just to do it. But the Pope also wanted that role. So it was a question whether the religious authority had that, or the government authority had that. And then we ended up in America recognizing that there are three equal but separate authorities. The head of the household, your religious body, your religious order, however that might be set up, and then the third being the civil state. So we've got neither one, and they have separate spheres of influence. That is against the idea that God has ordained one person or one to be over all, apart from Jesus Christ. So have you followed me to, the, to this point right here? Okay, here's how patronage works. In that system, if God has set one up, then you always have people buying, well, I wonder if God's made me that one. And they're always looking to be that one. They want to be in patronage, we call the patron, the, the one who's, who's that person that God centers upon, that's the patron. Um, you might call it in uh, clientelism, uh, they might just call him the big boss, as far as back from, and when you're looking at the worldview that Paul was in, that is Rome, that is Asia Minor. The church at Corinth, when they were having all the division, it wasn't this that they couldn't get along and they had all these sexual problems and the other problems that you're about to go into. Um, Bobby told me he wanted to go into chapter 5 next week, so I think, I've, I'm, I'm assuming that I've only got the last five to ten verses of chapter four. So we're going to read that here in a little bit, and you can correct me where it starts, because I wasn't here when he last finished. But if you want, you can turn to 1 Corinthians 4, but I'm setting up the understanding just in this way, with the understanding of patronage. The way the system works is, whoever that person is, you honor them. You give them money. You give them glory. You talk flowery language. You write them a letter, you extol their great virtues and how great they are, and you don't say anything bad about that person. You always do it, and they in turn, when times get rough, take care of you. Okay? In their system, in the Ivory Coast, if I take you to the Ivory Coast, we will say, it's a bribe. 
to give a police officer money. And we'll think, oh, that, that's horrible. But they don't think of it that way. They're recognizing the authority God's put there so that he'll take care of them in a later problem. They have no moral thought that it's wrong to give that guy money. And their whole system is built upon supporting those people to do it. Now, the only way that gets transformed is by changing of the renewing of the mind, the transforming of it by God's word. And the Hebrew model was very different than that. And so when Paul was teaching and sharing, that was the principal problem that he was treating at Corinth. When you had all these people that were vying for the position of the captain, you had four or five groups at least at Corinth who were saying, I'm chief. No, I'm chief. No, I am. And so when he talks about, I'm of Apollos, or I'm of Paul, or I'm of Christ, or I'm of some other group, they were all forming into cliques, and the fact that they weren't able to commune or eat together communion, that's the problem that's being treated here. If you read Corinthians with that understanding, it helps explain it a whole lot better in certain texts. But here, I mention that to simply say, um, when we're talking to people coming from other cultures, and we're in the area of Tennessee Tech and we have others, I have two ears so I can listen and one mouth so I can speak. So I want to listen at least twice as long as I speak. And I have found that I have saved myself so much difficulty by just listening to what the others are encountering as a problem when they talk to me. Because then that gives me the idea of their worldview, and then God gives me the scripture that's appropriate for them. So I hope that that helps you a little bit. And the other thing is, um, what those who were here, you participated Wednesday night. I think you're the only one. Mar Mark was here. That's right. Mark was here. Um, that's the other thing that I wanted to bring about. When you disciple people to hear the word of the Lord, what happens is there is a natural thirst, spiritual thirst, that is developed when that happens. A lot of times, in many Christian experience, they just come to church, they read the scripture, and they do what they've been told to do. Guess what? That works real well with the patronage model. Do you understand what I'm saying? You come to church, you have somebody else who tells you what to do, and you think it's great. But when we're talking about a dynamic experience, Jesus has literally saved my hide <laughs> a bunch of times by indicating to me in the word as I read it or something else that eh, I need to go here or do something or by giving me an interest that took me out of danger's way. Um, we've been through some really tumultuous, dangerous circumstances in Africa. Africa. But the Lord has always been faithful to give us an interest or take us away through his word at appropriate times. Um, so I hope I'm not rambling too much. But what I'm concentrating on when I shared Wednesday night when we do a discovery Bible study is that people start learning to recognize the Lord is asking this of me and then it's being affirmed with a group of others. And here's the difference. I, there's a young man named Romeo who in the Ivory Coast came out of drugs and alcohol. He's a college student who'd gotten caught up in drugs and alcohol. Family called him back home to the village where we were working back in 2005. And we allowed him to come to the house and teach our youngest child to speak French every day. And I listened to him, heard his problems, his worries about the future, where he wanted to go, and what he wanted to do. And we said, well, you know, you can come here to teach Corbin, but you can't come with alcohol or drugs on the background. I expect you to be clean when you're here. And then we'll go from there. And then we just talk. And then I decided to disciple him. Um, I don't know if you've ever seen it, but there's a book called Experiencing God. There's a, some time back, it, it has the same pathway where you teach people to listen and have personal experience where they're, they're seeking to understand what God is asking them to do and they're doing it. And that's always confirmed in a group of believers. It's never an individual thing always confirmed in the group. So I, I le led him in that kind of study, and he learned, this is a, now this, in his culture, 
you have to understand, in his culture, he could tell any white person or anybody from another tribe whatever was necessary to keep them happy. He could give his word of honor and everything and not keep it. Because among his tribe people, unless the chief says that this is what it is, nobody's word is good for anything. Okay, I, I, I hope you're following me. So, they could, so you could come in as a missionary and you could do this and they'd tell you, oh yeah, we'll help you and they'll help you to a certain point, but you could sign a contract for land, you could do anything else, you could give them money, you could put out all sorts of stuff, but if you don't know that about their cultural background, you just threw it away. <laughs> okay? Now, that's his background. So the way to help him break that, it's, it's a direct, I introduced him to listening to the voice of Jesus. Now then, did he escape? Because I set the rule of not coming to the house with drugs and alcohol, that is not what kept him from doing it. I introduced him to Jesus. And I introduced him to having the experience with God. And then he'd come and he'd say, you know, God was really talking to me the other day about this, but now he isn't. And I'd say, well, what did you do? <laughs> and then he'd say, well, I did this and this. I said, well, do you think that might be a... a wrong thing that God, well, well let, me, let me ask. And then he'd go study a little bit more. He'd identify us and he'd confess it and then God would talk to him again. <laughs> and he learned to walk with God that way. And it bra- it's broken in his life the idea that a man has been established by God to tell him what to do. You understand what I'm saying? He, he will listen to the counsel of many. He'll work with it. That's the problem Paul was addressing here. At the end of chapter 4 of Corinthians, and I have, my eyes are so tired from being awake last night like I was that I'm not seeing so clearly, so I have to put on reading glasses. All right, now I believe, I believe when I was with him that he had gotten to around verse uh, 13, but there's a just to give, give a break here. Um, this is 1 Corinthians chapter 4. And I'm just going to start from verse um, 10. I know he covered that, but I don't think he got beyond. I don't think he got. I'm going to read verse 10, though, through 21. And Paul is telling them, telling these people who have uh, basically said how rich they are. He's saying, we are fools for Christ's sake, but you are wise in Christ. We are weak, but you are strong. You are honorable, but we are despised. Even unto this present hour, we both hunger and thirst and are, bi- are naked and are buffeted and have no certain dwelling place. We, lab- we labor, working with our own hands, being reviled, we bless. Being persecuted, we suffer it. Being defamed, we entreat. We are made as the filth of the world and as the offscouring of all things unto this day. I write not these things to shame you, but as my beloved sons, I warn you. For though we have 10,000 instructors in Christ, or although ye have, you have 10,000 instructors in Christ, yet have not Yet you have not many fathers, for in Christ Jesus I have begotten you through the gospel. Wherefore I beseech you, be ye followers of me. For this cause I have sent unto you Timothy, who is my beloved son and faithful in the Lord, who shall bring you into remembrance of my ways, which he in Christ, as I teach everywhere in every church. Now, some are puffed up, and though I would not come to you, uh, as though I would not come to you, but I will come to you, whether if the Lord, shortly if the Lord will, and will know, not the speech of them, which are puffed up, 
but the power. For the kingdom of God is not in word, but in power. What will you? Shall I come unto you with a rod or in love and in the spirit of meekness? Um, Lord, open your word to a greater understanding in our lives and hearts and help us understand how to apply it more effectively in our lives. All right. I gave you that explanation of patronage a little bit earlier. And I gave you the explanation of how a bribe or giving a little bit is not considered. It was to kind of set up a little bit further what's here and what I'm going to describe. In the scriptures, another thing that's going on here is within this system, it matches what the scriptures call the world. I realized when I was a teenager uh, reading, Ron, I think you'd mentioned Josh McDowell to me. But I read Josh McDowell's evidence that uh, demands a verdict. And um, in that book, I think it was third or fourth chapter, he indicated that men are only governed by one of two means, mankind. We either have a powerful person who enforces everything down, and by force you make it down. Or you have people who are in allegiance with one another, who just agree to do it. And every government is kind of a mix of those things, as far as that level. So you've got no system that's 100% only by pledging and allegiance and everybody's holding perfectly accountable, and you have no system that's all just top-down power kingdom. Everything kind of shifts between those two. But in the scriptural system, when you read the world and you read what's happening, you read about the satanic kingdoms, the development, it's always referring to something that reflects what's called patronage. It's always the idea. So if I were to take you to the ancient kingdoms um, of China or Persia or Babylon or Egypt or even the Aztecs or the Incans um, in their structures, they would believe that God would reveal himself you know, to one man who was considered a god. So in other words, the king, the pharaoh, or Nebuchadnezzar, or the Persian king, he wasn't just a man. He was considered God. Why was he considered God? Because what he spoke was the law that everyone had to obey. Now then, in this world order, in this system, that is exactly what promotes patronage or clientelism. There's always a second level of people. And these second level of people are the people who are always pushing and promoting and, and saying, <clears throat> saying, he's a great king, great habit. So like the priests in the Aztec culture, when they were killing people, lifting up the hearts, it was to instill fear in the hearts of the people and to lift up the person they were saying as a god who would speak. And then you'd have the astrologers or others in the Egyptian kingdoms doing the same things. They were born of Osiris or whatever. Whatever the background, it's to make that person. So even the Japanese emperor in World War II, closer event, he was considered a god, wasn't he? This is that system. That's a different, they might have different shape of religions, but the systems all look this way. Now, these people are small. You have one at the top, then you have maybe it varies, three to 20 people, inner circle type people who understand. Then after that, you have what's called the bureaucracy. It's the middle managers. These are the people who map out the cities, decide we need how many grain stores, we have to have how many soldiers and what outposts. If we're gonna defend this, we have to have this area. They're the paper pushers. They're the people who just keep everything running. <clears throat> and this is the part that was most helpful to me. Like I told you, I realized when I was in my teenage years that people were changing the definition of words. And by changing the definition of words, they were changing the meaning of what we were saying. And so I said, if God has revealed himself by his word, then his words are defined with what is truth. So I embarked on a journey that took me through 15 years and I studied essential words. And one of those words was poverty. And it's from my study of that word poverty that I discovered this system along with the studies in anthropology. And then the word poverty, there are 11 different words in the Old Testament and there are four different words in, words in the New Testament that are translated poverty or poor. You know, 
there's only one, one, that even has an inkling of money. Okay? Is not having enough money. Everything else, all these references, refer more so to a social status. So you all know that a poor person in the United States often has a car, right? Yes or no? We've got a poverty level of what, $22,000 a year? Where I'm at, $300 a year, okay? <laughs> it's not a car. <laughs> that, that $300 a year, that, that's, that's bad. That's bad. Now, you making six, seven hundred a year? Mm, hard, really hard, hard. Making a thousand a year? Oh man, you're, you're, you've gotten there. The guy who works for us, he gets a thousand, twelve hundred dollars a year. He's on leadership councils. People want him because, I mean, he, he's taken in their system. They think, oh, he's got it made. The patron is taking care of him. Do you understand? You know how they're doing it. So we've got to be careful what we do. I explain this simply to go through when the scripture talks about the poor and you, what this forms is kind of like a pyramid of personnel. The poor are the people who do all the work with their hands. The poor are the people who dig the fields, who make the roads, who carry, the, who do the labor. That was it. And in some cultures, the poor had money, and other cultures, they didn't. So when you have in the Old Testament, it's talking about the gold kingdom and the silver kingdom and the kingdom that was made of with the uh, clay and iron mixed together. That was the difference, the difference of wealth that was spread through that kingdom and the understanding. So I hope you're, hope you're following me a little bit here. But as we get to this last part, that's what I was talking about. So the king and the other would have the authority, and they'd just tell the poor. When Paul is going through this and he's saying, first of all, uh, was Paul from a wealthy family or a poor family? He's from a wealthy family. And Paul, being a Jew, they had been taught that they have to make, now, now you think of Christ, the poor will always have with us, but the poor are those who inherit the earth because they, guess what? They work with their hands. Can you really understand how something works if you don't deal with it? You know, God made it that way. So, so the point is, there, there's a real reason behind that. So when you look at this passage, and you see that Paul is going into this culture that believes in this. This is what Nero, the gods, and all those guards, and all those, and he's going to them, and you've got these new Christians that are coming in, and, you know, he's saying, we've been taught, teaching you, follow, this is 1 Corinthians chapter 4, it's between verses 11 and 21, and, and when it's talking here, verse 12, he says, um, we labor with our own hands. He's saying, we're working at the bottom of the social rung. We're intentionally putting ourselves down here. He's trying to teach them something. And then he goes on through saying, um, being reviled. So if you are, the, the guys who are on the top social status chain, they never worked with their hands. They took, they took the bribes, they received the money, they got the other gravy or whatever you want to do from this. They never worked with their hands. And then they always insulted or, or made fun of the others. Paul was willing to accept that. Okay, I hope you're, you're, I hope you're following it. And it, it's a, it's a long term. He says, and the filth of all things for this, and I write these things not to shame you, but as my beloved sons, I'm warning you. For the way have and what he's trying to get across is, if you're going to follow Christ, this is the way you've got to go. You've got to become doers, not just organizers, not just planners. The divisions that exist in your church, which he's going to get to in later chapters that you're going to get to, you're going to have to do like me if you're going to overcome this. And so this is why the early church started things like hospitals or others and did work with their hands. And it was amazing. We didn't have the fear because people were stepping out of their comfort zones and giving with their lives to actually do hands-on work. Does this make a little more sense? I hope, I hope it is. 
I hope it is. So when we get on through here, and he sends them Timothy. Timothy was schooled of Jewish tradition, godly mother and grandmother. But Paul gets down, and the only, the only other part that I want to, to treat with you here or to get through is that he's planning to come to them shortly, and he's dealing with this puffed up. I want to deal with, with one thought here. Um, where I live and work, because of this understanding, patronage, um, I, uh, I have frequently quoted what Christ said, and I believe it is in, I believe it is in Matthew. I'd have to scour it because I didn't look it up before coming in this morning. But he said, uh, when the disciples were talking to him, to him and uh, he instructed not to call any man father, but a God which is in heaven. We have no man on earth who's our father other than our God in heaven. So when Paul tells them here to consider him a father, <laughs> that, that, that kind of bugs me. Because where I'm at in the culture, they will try to mask it in your way. But when they'll see me, they want to call me father, or they want to call me patron, or they want to call me, they want to put me into that world system. They want to do that. When, when Romans is talking about me not conform to this world, they're wanting to make me be that person for them. And I literally have to step back and say, no, no. God has given you all you need in Christ. He'll transform your mind. Let me help you find what he's already provided. But they have to work for it then. <laughs> that bothers some of them. Some of them won't do that. But many of them will because they're tired of living in this other novel. So I hope you're following. But Paul is referring to his here. Think of me a father. Why? Why do you think he would... <clears throat> Can, can you think of a can you think of a reason Paul because Christ was explicit referred to no man as father and Paul knew what Christ said so do you think he's breaking that commandment here because culture mm-hmm yeah, I, I just I wanted to give you pause to think through that because you know you might run into somebody here as we go through others have it but Paul I believe was using it as an example to create a distinction it isn't that he was accepting the title of father or the title of the provider for somebody who was not his father it's more that he was trying to make an illustration of look I'm just a passing teacher today You've, I've been around you three or four weeks maybe a little bit more, and I've been able to share, and I've enjoyed that, but I'm going to pass out of your life. I'm not going to be here. I'm going to be among the 10,000 that are here, that he's mentioning here. But Paul was the one who led them to Christ. For like Romeo, that kid that I introduced to follow Christ this way, uh, he'll give up his life to keep doing everything right now. And he, he, he's tired of pastors who play the game of, I'm a big chief and having it he says how do you handle it and I said you just obey and you work in court with them you work according to their understandings but then you continue with what God has given you to do and then Paul's understanding he's just making a distinction that the relationship with somebody who's led you to the Lord or whatever it's that closer bond of a discipleship that happens you have other people who pass through you pick up a book <clears throat> get an idea but Paul's simply saying here, there's a more intimate relationship with me. So here's the question. <clears throat> Does anyone follow me on that? So he isn't accepting a title of father, in my understanding. He's just using it as an illustration. And this is kind of critical for me because I've had some of the pastors in our church movements there who said, well, well Paul said to be calling him a father. I said, well, no, that's not quite what he was trying to say there. He's indicating the difference of the relationship that happens. <clears throat> and when you lead somebody to Christ, you introduce them to Christ, and they're experiencing it for the first time, there's an intimacy there that exists, that doesn't exist apart from that. Make sense? The last part that I see here, and that I want to bring attention, oh, look at that. My eyes are really tired. 
normally are sharp in the morning. They are not this morning. All right, the last part I want to say here is, is um, well, I won't put you on the spot, <clears throat> but one of the other words that I spent time defining with, and if you want, I'll tell you how, how we did it. It was easily done. You can do it so easily on a computer today. <clears throat> but it's this part when he said, when I come to you with a rod or in love. Psalm 23, we talked about how Christ will discipline us with a rod. <clears throat> or he'll put us. So, <clears throat> and the other one he says, or in love. And in the spirit of meekness. Now, one of the one of the challenges I had with the denominational mission was when I grew up and how I understand meekness is not how many in our churches understood meekness. Uh, meek and lowly Jesus, meek and mild, um, simply meant um, quiet, not very forceful. Mm. Listens a whole lot before saying anything. Late teens dawned on me. Jesus was the meekest good ever lived on earth. Moses was considered meek. <laughs> but they were not quiet people. <laughs> Meekness, I came to understand, was taught strength under control. Have you heard that definition? Okay. Meekness means that you're bearing a sword you know how to bear that sword you know how to carry that gun whatever your weapon is you've got it down you've got something by you you can, you can do that act of slicing that, slicing that banana in half whatever you can do all sorts of tricks with it but you don't show it off you don't put it out you only pull it out when you need it it has nothing to do with you not having it it means you have capacity but it is controlled that's the idea of meekness so when Paul's giving them choice here, he's saying, okay, I'm aware of problems in your assembly. You either get this fixed to a point that I'm hearing words coming back as your spiritual father, one who kind of helped you get started here, and I'm going to come back one of two ways. I'm either going to come with a rod, meaning I already know what I'm coming to do to judge you for, <laughs> and I'm going to punish you, or what's the other option? Meekness and love. Which means, so what, what, is, what do you think is the, it's, it's not in the text, but it does come out in the following chapters. What do you think is driving Paul's decision? Whether he's going to come with a rod, or whether he's going to, yeah, to, to what? That, that is right, their obedience. Because he's not defining to them right immediately, but they must do, right? We're about to get there. But that is it exactly. The question is, are they going to be of a willing spirit? Are they going to confront these problems on their own? Or does he have to come here and does he have to come and force the issue for them? Jude wrote that we can save some by the fire and that we can save others according to love. And you know, that's out of it. You have to be able to do both. Don't let somebody tell you it's one or the other. It is both. And one is required in some circumstances and others are required in others. It's just dependent. So may the Lord bless you. Did that help your understanding a little bit today? Hold on to the idea of patronage. If you have a chance, look it up. Understand it. The, um, the system that I ascribed of trading, of clientelism, is another term you can find it. But um, it was believed at the beginning of the 20th century that that way of exchange was gone. But around the 1970s, 1960s, there is a concentrated resurgence of that world model, and it has done a great deal to undermine the nation states and to support the excessive wealth generation that we have happening around the world now, and it's used as a justification. So we're entering into another time of, of um, divine rights of kings or powered people. And Corinthians is a great study to understand how that can be broken. So may the Lord bless you, increase your understandings, and protect you and your families.